The Melba Story. The story of Australia's most famous woman. The true story, fully authenticated, and featuring another wonderful Australian singer, Glenda Raymond. The Melba Story. In 1917, while Melba was in the United States giving a series of concerts, and at the same time doing all in her power to counteract the efforts of German agents who were trying to keep America out of the war, a strange series of accidents took place. Her car was involved in a collision, a locomotive burst. Then her private railway car became uncoupled and began to run backwards, but was fortunately stopped in time. Soon afterwards, however, while she was singing in Texas, a chandelier fell from the ceiling and Melba was crushed beneath a mass of splintered glass and twisted metal. She was carried to her dressing room and examined by a doctor who soon gave her the verdict. Your wrist has been broken in two places, madam, and your leg is badly lacerated. Oh. But it might easily have been worse. If you hadn't turned aside when you heard that shout of warning, you'd probably have been killed. Yes, doctor. And I imagine that some people are going to be very disappointed when they hear that I'm not dead. You mean, you think it was deliberate? Well, it isn't the first narrow escape I've had since I've been in this country. From the day I arrived, things have been happening. But this is the nearest they've got to putting me out of action. But who'd want to do that? There are people who apparently have the idea that I'm giving too much help to the Allied cause, and they're out to stop me. Well, they're not going to do it. You intend to continue your tour? Not only that... I intend to continue this concert. Oh, no, you must. But don't you see? It's the only way to show these people that we can't be beaten. You're a very determined woman. We British are a very determined race when we have to be. And this is one occasion when it's necessary to show the flag. So please ask them to tell the audience that the concert's going on exactly according to schedule. And so, and so, Madam Melba insists that the concert shall go on as a ring. Which means, which means that she will now sing Spargy Tomorrow Pianto from the opera Lucia de Lamour by Donatelli. <laughs>
come along with me to the Senate House this afternoon. President Wilson is going to make a very important speech. Mrs. Longworth, you don't mean... Nobody knows for sure. But my cousin, Franklin D. Roosevelt, is pretty close to the president. And he advised me to be there this afternoon. Now, how about you? I'll be there. Don't you worry, I'll be there. And so, with a profound sense of the solemn and even tragical character of the step I am taking, and of the grave responsibilities which it involves, I advise that the Congress declare the recent course of the Imperial German government to be, in fact, nothing less than war against the government and people of the United States. We accept this challenge. The world must be made safe for democracy. Congratulations, Madam Melba. Or should I now call you Dame Melba? Oh, call me what you like, Mrs. Longworth. But I understand the correct title is Dame Nellie. Dame Commander of the British Empire. Well, you certainly deserve the honor. There isn't a woman alive who's put up a better fight for her country. It wasn't that I wanted any more blood to be spilt. You realize that, don't you? It was just that I knew that if America came into the war, it would end all the sooner. Everybody knows that, Dame Nellie. And now I'm going back to London to wait for peace, so that I'll be able to concentrate again on the things that really matter. Thank you. Oh. Is there bad news? Yes. You've heard of the great tenor, Jean Doresque? No, I'm afraid I have not. So soon forgotten. I wonder if it will be like that with me. Oh, no one will ever forget Melpa. Then no one should ever forget Jean Doresque. He was one of the greatest artists who ever lived. He is not dead, yes? No, but he is dying, Louise. Pack my things, please. We're leaving for Nice immediately. Jean, do you know me? Why, of course. It's Nelly. Come to watch me make my final bow, eh? I came to ask if there was anything you wanted, Jean. Yes. Yes, I'd like to hear you sing again. What shall I sing for you? I shall never forget you as Louise. I should like to go from this world with the sound of the puits le jour in my ears. Oh, Jean. Le puits le jour où je me suis donné Oh, Nelly, I can think of no more beautiful voice. Let us talk. Let us remember the gay moments. Our visit to Windsor Castle, for instance, when we kept singing and singing for the Queen. <laughs> Will you ever forget Tosti, with his long cape and big hat, looking just like a black beetle? <laughs> and now Tosti is dead, and the Queen too, and King Edward. And Sarah Bernhardt. All the great ones. The gay moments, Jean, and the moments of triumph. 
I'll never forget how thrilled I was the first time I heard you sing. It was at the Paris Opera, and you were singing Don Jose and Carmen. Do you remember your entrance in the second act when you start singing off stage? You came in singing... <laughs> remember, Jean? Nelly, Nelly, you are wonderful. You mustn't get excited, Jean. You must rest. Why? What difference does it make? I want you to rest. For you, Nelly. Anything. That's my Jean. But you will not go away. No. I'll stay with you. Until you're asleep. Great days. Great singers. Patty. The great Patty. And then Melba. Oh, what an artist. Don't try. Yes. It has been good for him to see you, madame. How long, doctor? Mm, a few days at the most. It will be hard to imagine a world without Jean Duresque. Yes, he has been a wonderful artist. We must be grateful that Melba will still be with us. No. Why? What do you mean? The great ones are going. And I feel, all of a sudden, rather lonely. And so I think the time has come to say goodbye. In just a few moments, we'll return to the Melba story. Melba story. The years that followed the 1914-18 war brought a sense of disillusionment to Melba. She had long realized that the old spacious days were over. The death of King Edward VII had ended all that. But this new attitude of cynicism and irreverence, this frantic attempt to escape from reality, it saddened Melba and undermined her health. And so in October 1925, she made her decision. At her house in Mansfield Street, she received representatives of all the leading newspapers and then quite casually made her announcement. The truth is, gentlemen, that I'm going to retire. Oh, no. You, uh, you don't believe me. Well, pardon our incredulity, Dame Nelly, but we've been listening to prima donna say that kind of thing for years. <laughs> Patty announced her retirement in 1895, and she was still going strong 20 years later. <laughs> well, this isn't going to be a repetition of the Patty business. I really mean it. But why should you retire? Because I know when to stop. I've been singing for 37 years, you know, and although I feel no more than 25, I realise that I'm... Um, well, a little older than that. <laughs> oh, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen, but I've made my decision. I'm going to give a farewell performance at Covent Garden. My very own Covent Garden. So I prepared myself for what was to be the saddest night of my life. The night of my farewell appearance at Covent Garden. The public reaction to my announcement was almost incredible. An hour before the previous night's performance had ended, a queue began to form up. And throughout the night, a steadily growing crowd waited outside the opera house. Yes, they actually waited for 21 hours. Those dear, dear people who had been my friends for so long. And so the time came for me to enter the stage door at Covent Garden for the last time as an artist. 
As usual, the first to greet me was the stage door keeper, Austin. Good evening, Dame Nelly. Good evening, Austin. So this is the last time we'll be greeting each other at the stage door before a performance. I... I don't want to think about that. Do you remember the first night I came to Covent Garden? I do that. I was very young and very nervous and very worried. But you cheered me when you smiled at me and said, Good evening, Madame Melba. Said it a good many times since then. Yes. I've been singing at Covent Garden for 38 years, Austin. I started here a couple of years before you came. Do you remember being jealous because the Prince of Wales escorted me to my carriage? Well, I'd always done it, you know. Yes, but the Prince didn't know that. No. Anyhow, Austin, I'd like you to accept this diamond pin as a slight appreciation of all you've done for me. Why? Why, thanks, Danielle. It's... It's the letter M. M for... Melba. The program on that never-to-be-forgotten night was the balcony scene from Romeo and Juliet, the fourth act of Otello, and the third and fourth acts of La Boheme. I had with me three fellow Australians, Browning Mummery, John Brownlee, and Frederick Collier, so that it was practically an all-Australian cast. In the royal box were King George V and Queen Mary, and I should say that almost every distinguished person in England was present that night. I was close to tears more than once, but did my best to sing the music as it should be sung. Even when the time came for that pathetic little trifle, Mimi's farewell.
all. It has been a great and glorious evening, and a sad one too for me, to think that I shall never sing again within these beloved walls. Covent Garden is my artistic home, and I love it. I want to thank too my dear, dear public, ever kind to me, the management, the orchestra, those dear stagehands. I have a souvenir which they have presented to me. I want to thank you, my dear old friend, Austin, the stage doorkeeper, who for years longer than I care to remember has put me in my carriage as I have left Covent Garden and bade me good night. I won't say goodbye because farewell is such a very beautiful word. I'm sure you all know that it's part of a prayer and means fare thee well which I wish you all, and I feel sure that you wish me the same. Farewell. The last of the famous Melba Knights, the last song of a great singer. It was not quite the end of the story, for there were five more years of life remaining. Five more years before she was taken from us forever. The song must end. And even the loveliest twilight must send the blackbird to her rest. The Melba story was written by John Ormiston Reed and produced by Dorothy Crawford. The Australian Symphony Orchestra was conducted by Hector Crawford. The role of Melba was spoken by Patricia Kennedy and sung by the Australian coloratura soprano, Glenda Raymond. <laughs>